Does anyone here have a favorite mantra or motto? Something that inspires you or helps you get through the day? Maybe it's a post-it note stuck to the bathroom mirror. Or maybe it's a print hung in your living room. Or maybe it's just a quote on your cell phone's home screen. Let's see a show of hands. If you do, the conference would love to know what inspires you. Please share it with us via social media using the hashtag evokepresence. If you ever come to my house, you may or may not notice that I have mantras everywhere. The mantras aren't overt, but they are included in the art that I choose to live with in order to passively remind myself of different things. For instance, this large piece is a canvas wrap of a photo I took, and it reminds me to question everything. This piece hangs in my office, and it reminds me to be kind. This piece is on the stairs on the way up to my bedroom, and it reminds me that if I like myself, other people will like me too. Finally, I made this piece in my bathroom to remind me that everything isn't always the way it seems, and it prompts me to imagine what else things could be. I'm sharing my art collection with you, not because I'm a master collector, but because I believe in the power of art, and I believe in the power of mantras. Since 2015, I've been spreading a positive and inclusive message around the city of Chicago as a kind of communa mantra. I started doing this because too many things have unintentionally evolved into reasons for us to not get along. So I wanted to create something that instead exists solely to remind us all to get along and help each other succeed. I define a communa mantra as a positive, publicly visible, unifying statement that expresses a community's basic beliefs. I coined this phrase because I think communities can benefit from the power of mantras the way that we all do as individuals. You may think this is a newer novel idea, but in fact it's not. Take Matthew Hoffman's You Are Beautiful. He started this project 14 years ago when he passed out only 100 stickers. This phrase reminds people that they are beautiful the way they are. Now, over three million stickers have been stuck that allow strangers to stumble upon them, maybe when they need it the most. The project was picked up by Oprah, and this positivity has been embraced around the world. His project has been a huge inspiration to me and my project, and shows me the power of what a phrase can do. There's also a precedent already for this type of idea working for a city. We all recognize this logo. It was created by Milton Glaser in the 1970s as an image, as part of an advertising campaign designed to heal a decaying New York City through tourism. Glaser did the work entirely pro bono in the name of helping his city rise again. If you've been to New York City recently, this may seem like fake news. But it's not. Back in the 70s, New York needed all the help it could get. The city was just hours away from bankruptcy, and President Ford was refusing a federal bailout. They were laying off one-sixth of the city's workers, and despite the crime, that included police officers. As a protest, the police themselves published and distributed a million copies of this guide for tourists called Fear City. Teachers and garbage men went on strike, and according to the city's then police commissioner, crime was at its highest level in the history of the city. There was a crack cocaine epidemic, and certain neighborhoods, like the Lower East Side and parts of the Bronx, were totally deteriorating. But the logo gave the city something to love, something to rally behind. And crucially, the campaign appeared to have awakened something within New Yorkers themselves. Glazer said later that the shift in public mentality was the most extraordinary thing. One day, people just woke up tired of sleep, stepping in dog poop and garbage. People got fed up and said, this is our city. We're going to take it back, and we're not going to allow this stuff to happen anymore. A big part of that moment was this campaign. So did I love New York just 
help create a new positive image for the city so the tourists would return? No, it did way more than that. It awakened New Yorkers' love for their own city, and that's what saved New York City. I'm highlighting New York's logo because I believe a communal mantra should incorporate art. I say this because art has a unique ability to reach people when language fails. Sometimes words fail us because conversations are just too difficult. People avoid talking about certain topics because they don't want to hurt each other's feelings or risk offending anyone. It's these topics where art helps the most, and it's these topics we need to talk about. Art allows a viewer to interpret the message themselves. This individual dialogue allows for a powerful change at best, or at worst, the viewer just says, well, that's just art. How I just described New York City reminds me a lot of how Chicago is thought of today. In fact, as a Chicagoan, I'm constantly reminded of how terrible everything is by people who don't live here. So naturally, this is something that is always in the back of my mind and something I want to fix. So one night in June 2015, I was walking my dog, Benson. God, he's handsome, isn't he? <laughs> I was thinking about my journey from Canada to America and how I had wanted to be a professional baseball player. Just before my senior year, my mom allowed me to chase this dream. I moved to Minnesota to live with my aunt and my uncle and my three small cousins. I thought about how it was so weird to go to school my senior year and not know a single person. I was reminded that the worst thing about this transition wasn't missing my family, and it wasn't even the feeling I used to get walking into the lunchroom and having no one to sit with. The worst was the feeling I would get whenever I had to correct one of my new classmates when they said a so-called harmless racial comment. The kind of ignorant comment where it didn't matter if there was or wasn't a minority in the room. These things are always just wrong to say. So I corrected people. As a new kid in town, I didn't care if it was the prom queen or the captain of the football team. Sometimes my lecture was received properly, but other times it was at best uncomfortable and at worst an actual altercation. These moments happened infrequently where I grew up, but in this new place, I was needing to say something more often. I noticed that what I had always felt comfortable doing infrequently was now happening frequently enough that I was starting to feel like a nag. I also didn't have the comfort of knowing people, so I actually had the weird thought that what I was doing might be hurting me and allowing me to not make new friends. So instead of having the strength to continue to do what I had always done, what I knew was right, I was weak, and I stopped correcting people. Embarrassingly, I started to pretend I just didn't hear these hateful comments whenever they were said. So on this walk, I realized that all these years later, I was still mad at myself for that weakness. I should have kept correcting those hateful comments. I realized that if society is ever going to solve racism and hatred, we all need to correct these comments right when they happen. We need to be able to say that hate-based comments are wrong, but we need to do this in the right way. A way that gives people the confidence to correct the hatred no matter what, and a way that makes the message received. We need a communal mantra. It was with all these thoughts in my head that Benson and I passed a white wall. In all the years of living in my neighborhood, this wall had never been tagged and it had never been graffitied. As a result, it sticks out like a sore thumb to me. For months, I had been playing a pointless thought game saying, what could I write on that wall that if I did, it might not need to be removed? So with all these horrible high school memories on my mind and my brain marinating on Chicago's problems, the phrase, we all live here, popped into my head. The thought stopped Benson and I in our tracks. Yes, Benson and I. <laughs> I actually remember saying, wow, out loud. In that very moment, to me, the phrase meant, Racial equality, gender equality, sexual equality, income equality, and even environmental issues. Those four simple words encompass some of the most hard to talk about but important issues of our time. And they did so in a disarming but effective way. It's the inclusion of the phrase that makes it powerful. 
It's the inclusion of the phrase that makes it safe to say. And it's the inclusion that makes it possible for a message to be received. Maybe we all live here could be a communal mantra that could give people a vocabulary and a reminder to help end hate. Maybe just casually seeing these words every day in the familiar surroundings of our own neighborhood could establish a new baseline thought of inclusion for us all. I asked my friends what the phrase meant to them. Luckily, they answered the same things that I had thought it meant, so I was encouraged. Not being a shy person, I printed some signs that said the phrase, and I took them around the city. I wanted to know if tourists or strangers would let me take their picture while they held the signs. Hundreds and then thousands of people did. I posted all these pictures to a blog on Tumblr, and to my surprise, Tumblr featured the blog. I ended up with thousands of followers in a week. And what was really cool was I started waking up to messages from strangers all over the world, urging me to keep spreading this message, telling me they loved what I was doing and that the world needed to hear this message. This particular message from a stranger in Vietnam was my favorite. I really love that last line, everybody always smile. It's just beautifully grammatically incorrect. Because of the blog, I was invited to speak to a high school media studies class taught by a teacher friend of mine. Just talking to his class even made the, the local high school's paper. After the school called me again, and they said, what could we do as a school with the phrase? Here was my opportunity to introduce a communal mantra. I told them I'd come up with something and get back to them. Well, what I came up with is a program for schools called ACT. Everyone knows schools love acronyms. So mine stands for Art, Community, and Technology. Three pillars of what I think make us all human. And three things that I can build off of to make this and keep this interesting to students. The main initiative of the program is to create public art using the phrase as a theme, like you see on the screen. I visit participating schools, and I conduct assemblies for the entire school. I do this so that every child goes through an exercise with me to understand what we all live here means in order to help me create a logo for the art project at their school. From their drawings, I source the ideas to make an official logo, which gets put onto products that we sell to help raise the money necessary for the art. It's sort of like a hyper-local iHeart New York. And this ownership strategy also has the dual benefit of ensuring that students care more about the art when they see it every day. Because they are directly involved in its creation, they wear the clothes with pride, and they show off the art to friends and family. By creating public art, and not art in a classroom or locked in a hallway of the school, it also makes the local community get involved so they can help support the art. This introduces students to local leaders and business owners who they may never have met otherwise. While I worked on getting school signed up, because we know that takes a while, I started doing street art with the phrase all over the city to spread this message. I used chalk so I wasn't illegally tagging, tagging anything. Also, I think chalk as a medium perfectly symbolizes the struggles against racism and hatred that we have as a society. And what I mean by that is there's no pill for us all to take that will magically solve these problems. It will take us all chipping in a little bit every day to make these problems go away. And by having to maintain the murals after it rains or snows, I feel like I'm embodying the struggle through my art. Finally, it's way more noticeable to kids. When young kids see it, they usually have to ask their parents what it means. And that starts a conversation, a very meaningful conversation. I started getting positive feedback while writing on the walls from people walking, biking, or driving by. People were frequently taking pictures of the art and tagging it, allowing me to collect data that people love this phrase, that people were definitely into the communal mantra. Could what I was doing help make a community better? Could something just written on a wall or hung on a fence or communicated through art help a city like Chicago heal itself? It's still early, but the answer is definitely yes. A kindergarten teacher at the very first school to do the ACT program 
gave me this quote. Literally seeing the words, we all live here, in English and Spanish every day has gotten us talking about it. First, it was explaining to the students what it means. Now it is the kiddos sharing their various experiences of living or seeing we all live here in action. It's been the perfect way to tie our IB learner profiles and attitudes into the community around us. Again, literally and figuratively. This was incredible. The phrase was already having an impact on kindergartners. This is important because I believe in order to actually end racism and hatred, we have to start with our kids. By working with schools of all ages, we can help a generation of young people grow up with the vocabulary for safely and effectively correcting hatred whenever they encounter it. But as a teacher told me early in this project, the idea needs to be cool. So how do we make ending hatred cool? Well, we can use art, fashion, music, and sports to highlight our communal mantras. By becoming a part of popular culture, the communal mantra can be cool. Hatred's out there lurking, and we don't know when it will strike. But when it does, young people need to be ready so they don't shy away from correcting hatred, like I shamefully once did. Do you want to help end racism and hatred? Do you want to help people know what to say when they hear hateful things? Then I challenge you, create your own communal mantra or just use the tools that I've created to introduce we all live here to wherever you live. Many people are waiting for America to be great. Working together and through communal mantras, I've proven that we can make it greater than it's ever been. I'm going to finish today with a story that an artist friend once told me. He told me how a nice old lady came up to him while he was painting a mural next to a park. She had gone all the way out of her way to tell him how much she loved his work, and right as he was about to hug her, she said, this is the kind of thing that will keep those people out of the park. Those people. Imagine the artist's shock. Imagine the shock of going from wanting to hug someone to wanting to hurt them. It, this story highlights the dangers of hateful comments. We don't know who or when or when, what they will say, so we don't see them coming. They offend us and inflame us so badly and when we react poorly, this only strengthens the hateful person's beliefs. Well, I know where that park is, and I put a communal mantra up across the street. So imagine if that hateful woman comes back again, and when she does, a child instead appears with a perfect response to her hatred, a response that they had internalized from a lesson learned in school or the communal mantra on the wall across the street. What if that child just calmly points at it and walks away. Imagine the power of that. Imagine how the woman would have to feel when she was left reflecting on the fact that she was reminded by a child that we all live here. Thank you.